It is always a pleasure to introduce both a colleague and a personal friend. I do owe a great debt of gratitude to David O'Connor, who on more than one occasion gave me copies of his Abydos excavation slides to use in my own lectures. David is a Lila Asherson Professor of Ancient Egypt, Egyptian Art and Archaeology at New York University's Institute of Fine Arts. He was trained in Egyptology at University College London and was awarded his PhD by the University of Cambridge. From 1964 to 1996, David was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania and curator in charge of the Egyptian collection of the Penn Museum. He has excavated in Nubia and Egypt, but is possibly best known for his excavations at Abydos. He has authored and co-edited a number of books, including Ancient Nubia, Egypt's Rival in Africa, and Abydos, Egypt's Earliest Pharaohs, and the Cult of Osiris. More recent publications include Ramesses III, The Life and Times of Egypt's Last Hero, co-edited with Eric Klein, and The Old Kingdom Town at Buhan, recently published by the Egypt Exploration Society. David is a longtime member and past president of the American Research Center in Egypt and is currently a member of AUC's Board of Governors. His topic tonight, and I see it's been changed from what I have in my notes, so what I'll say is all you ever wanted to know about Narmer's mysterious palette. In fact, maybe more than you ever wanted to know about Narmer's palette. Please give a warm welcome to David O'Connor. Thanks for that very nice introduction and summing up all my wicked past. Um, and so it suddenly reminded me, this just arrived in the mail today. Uh, this is the old kingdom town of Wuhan, uh, at which I was a site supervisor under uh, Brian Emery many years ago, way back in 1961, 62. You remember 61, 62? Uh, we finally got it published. <laughs> so, I'll it's available now. Um, but tonight I'm talking about something earlier even than the Old Kingdom, and that is the very famous Nama palette, which is one of the earliest definitely royal monuments we have to survive uh, to us from ancient Egypt. Um, as you know, um, Egypt can be thought of in terms very much of its kingship. Uh, it was the dominant institution in Egypt for millennia. Uh, we know uh, many of the kings by name, we know some of them by biographical and historical information. So our, our, our mental imagery about Egypt is very much dominated uh, by the images of the kings, such as the colossal figures of Ramses II at Medina Pabu, uh, which are uh, spread throughout the entirety of Egyptian history. Uh, but how far back can we trace this practice of making images of the king and placing it in uh, propitious and significant locations, in temples and other places. Uh, we can certainly talk about images of kings being produced in the first two historic dynasties, in the first and the second dynasties. The surviving material is pretty small scale. Uh, this is the statuette of Kasekemi, the last king of the second dynasty. There are one or two other uh, images of him known, and also a few images of other uh, first and second dynasty kings, but they're all pretty small, um, and I guess that's the curse of being very old in Egypt. It gives you the longest exposure to all the bad things that can happen later on when uh, uh, statues were reused for all kinds of uh, purposes. Um, this is just to remind you about the general pattern of events that we can trace through uh, prehistoric Egypt into the early dynasties, dynasties one and two. Um, in the upper part of the screen is the image just to remind us that early on in the prehistoric period, Egypt actually had two cultures, one in the south, one in the north, and very different in many uh, aspects of their material culture, at least. We don't know much about other arenas of differentiation. Um, round about this point in the chronology, and I'm not trying to be too precise with the chronology, um, you get a unified culture. Uh, the people living in the north of Egypt take over or adopt or assume the typical material culture of southern Egypt. So we see some kind of a cultural merging. It's very hard to know what that might mean in terms of politics or military power or historical events. Uh, then we get to my favorite dynasty, Dynasty Zero. Um, uh, unfortunately, when the Egyptians started to keep records of their kings and were eventually recorded uh, by the 
Egyptian uh, priest Manito many, many centuries uh, after this early period. Um, they could only take it back really to the very beginning of the first dynasty or so. Uh, and so as uh, in recent years, or over the last uh, 20 years by now, uh, as we discovered evidence of kings who existed before King Nama and the first dynasty, uh, they have to be packaged as dynasty zero. Uh, so we have a little bunch of royal names, not so much in the way of royal images, uh, which belong into the dynasty zero phase. Um, and um, our friend Jack Josephson and uh, his colleague Gunter Dreyer uh, just published a couple of years ago a very fascinating article about tiny royal monuments that belong to this dynasty zero fading into Nama period. Then you have Nama, and you people like to just argue as to whether he is actually the first king of the first dynasty or the last king of dynasty zero. Um, I don't mind. You can have him whichever way you want. Uh, but because of the iconography and the artwork associated with him, representations of royalty uh, associated with him, he has a kind of uh, iconic significance to Egyptologists. So then you get, following that, Dynasty I um, and, and Dynasty II, and the survival, uh, increasing over time, of uh, images of, of, of royalty for a variety of, of purposes. Uh, this is just to remind you that the uh, basic outline of uh, prehistoric Egypt and early historic Egypt uh, depends upon the surviving of material culture, mostly represented in graves and especially usefully represented in ceramic. Uh, many years ago, uh, well, about 100 years ago actually, uh, Flinders Petrie was able to show uh, that the pottery of the prehistoric period could be arranged into chronologically sequential groups with the, uh, this, this particular diagram of his, uh, with the earliest material at the top, and then different phases of prehistoric and then finally early historic Egypt uh, represented by changes in pottery style, pottery fabric, uh, a whole range of things. What's perhaps quite more interesting to us in the light of uh, what I'm talking about tonight is the way in which art, which is well represented in the earlier periods on the pottery, you get paintings of, of, of a, a fairly high degree of, of elaboration. Um, but gradually, as time goes on, and you would have seen many wonderful examples of this in uh, the great uh, prehistoric exhibit that uh, Diane Patch uh, curated uh, not so long ago. Um, by the time you get down into very late prehistoric, Dynasty Zero, getting into the First Dynasty, um, all that wonderful artistic richness that you get in some categories of prehistoric pottery has disappeared. And uh, along with this, society is becoming much more stratified, kingship is emerging, one gets the sense that art is no longer accessible to the people as a whole. Art is being monopolized by royalty and the elite that supply it. This is one of the major products of that monopolization of artistic initiative. Uh, this is the Nama palette. Uh, many of you may have actually seen it in Cairo Museum where it, uh, it's always on display. Um, uh, many years ago, I discussed with that of us who was then the head of the Antiquities Organization. Why couldn't we have some wonderful exhibit over here in the States and have as the centerpiece the Nama palette? And he said, being Zahi, why not? And said, let's go see the director of the museum, Cairo Museum. And the director of the Cairo Museum said, the palette of Nama will never leave Egypt. So it's treasured in Egypt as something iconic and significant uh, uh, for uh, Egyptian culture, as well as having uh, uh, all this recognition uh, in the world outside Egypt. So the Nama palette is um, um, about, well, I keep saying it's about two feet tall. Uh, I heard someone a couple of days ago say it's about three feet tall. So it's somewhere between two feet and three feet. And I, I meant to check the dimensions before it came, but I didn't do it. So it's a large piece of stone, and it's a heavy piece of stone. It's a very distinctive piece of stone uh, uh, that comes from forests of the east of Egypt and was typically used for objects of this kind. The Nama palette, like others which date before it, um, nothing much like it that dates after it, but certainly before it, there are very similar artifacts uh, stretching quite way back into prehistoric times. 
Uh, these are pellets, these are cosmetic pellets. And they are intended to, uh, at least theoretically, nominally, maybe not always in practice, uh, they in, are intended to be a hard, fine-grained surface on which you could grind mineral materials, which would be used in cosmetics, add some liquids to it to, to make it uh, applicable, um, and then to uh, uh, actually utilize it. And that central circular feature over there uh, uh, represents the area uh, where the mixing of the minerals and the preparation of the cosmetic would take place, and then it would be applied to, well, not to elite people, because these objects seem to have been made for temples, early temples. These were objects dedicated to early temples uh, and uh, uh, intended to placate and please the deity of whatever particular temple it was. Um, very few of them have been recovered through excavation, and even the ones that have been Covered, recovered by excavation, it's not actually that easy to know how they were originally uh, arranged or presented in the early temple context. These areas have been uh, heavily deserved, dis disturbed, even in some of the items like the Namo Kale survived. So to a great degree, uh, we have to kind of try to understand what it's all about from uh, what is represented on it. That's one important uh, arena. Uh, but, um, and the context contextual arena is not very helpful. Uh, but the other thing that's important about the Nama palette, and this is one of the things I wanted to emphasize tonight, that's uh, something kind of new, well, maybe new in my thinking. I was always a bit of a purist about things like the Nama palette and other early material, when people would reach down into later periods and bring up uh, Egyptian customs, iconography, other things, that they felt had some kind of representation in the early period as well, prehistoric periods or, uh, uh, or the period of the first dynasty or the period of Nama or in between. And so I was feeling, well, it's not really right to go down into later periods. So much would have happened in Egypt. Uh, we, should, we should keep it all separate. Um, and then a couple of things happened over the last year or so, and I'll be talking about them both. Um, but now I'm ready to reach for, for anything. <laughs> at any period, I think it will help us understand or at least appreciate the richness of meaning uh, that the Nama palette represents. So I totally changed my mind about the methodology that can be utilized here. Carefully, of course, everything in Egyptian studies has to be used carefully, but uh, I'm much bolder about it, and since I'm gathered here with friends tonight, I may even be a little more bold than, than I've been in, in, in elsewhere. Uh, so, what the heck is the Nama palette all about? Well, it's got very beautifully carved scenes on, uh, on both the front. Uh, one side and the other side, let me try to me not worry about front and rear. Um, and um, in some ways, the most striking of them is this image here, which is relatively large scale, fills most of the visual field, uh, and shows King Nama uh, about to apparently strike with a mace um, a terrified opponent of some kind who is kneeling in front of him, uh, not bound or anything like that, because in later ideology, there we are, later early ideology already, raising its head. Uh, in later ideology, uh, you want to realize that these uh, 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 prisoners and enemies that the king is about to do something very nasty to uh, are actually paralyzed with terror. As soon as they're in the ambience of the king, they become incapable of everything and they're automatically his, his victims. So, we have a very striking representation of that image, and as you will see and probably realize, uh, it, it, it gets tremendous re repetition through the following millennia. Uh, the images on this side don't get so much repetition. Um, this is the area where the cosmetic material uh, is prepared. I said it was dedicated to temples, and that means the cosmetics were applied to the image of the god in the temple, which would probably be fairly small as it was in later times. Um, uh, and uh, in later times, deities, images of deities, went through a whole kind of every morning waking up process where they were woken and cleaned and fed and had cosmetics put on and clothing put on, often in highly symbolic ways, but all part of the reawakening of the deity and its connection to the human world. And of course, because it was for deities, laden with all kinds of um, cosmological and other meaning. So that, that little circle, uh, which is visually central on that face, is a very important part of the total pattern. 
Sopopons, great felines with long, snaky necks, uh, actually forming the circle and yet being restrained as if they were a threat to the circle. And this combination of uh, the promise of good things and the anxiety about bad things is actually very typical of these poets. It's representing the two uh, themes in Egyptian thought that uh, continue to be very important. And this is being restrained by um, these two um, individuals. So there is something dangerous about these circle paths, as they are. I was going to say you will never see them again. You see them on a few early objects from Egypt. Uh, they seem to be derived from the Near East, uh, directly or indirectly. Um, and, and then they disappear. But of course, as you, many of you here know, they don't disappear. They turn up in the Middle Kingdom later on, on so-called magic wands and things of this kind. Why they are revived is hard to tell. But overall, it's true to say they disappear. So this is an icon that continues. This is one that disappears. And this is a highly enigmatic attitude of Egyptologists. We like to think they're Egyptians. Um, disturbing image. Uh, this shows King Nama in procession, uh, moving across the visual field uh, with a, a bunch of standard bearers in front of him, uh, uh, bearing uh, propitious and important uh, symbols. So it's a very kind of ceremonial, calm looking scene. But they are walking towards some 10 uh, alien people uh, who have been laid out in two neat rows. Uh, they have been decapitated. They don't have heads anymore. Uh, their heads are there. Their heads are there between their feet. So it's a very gruesome image, um, which of course recalls the striking image on the other face, but is uh, really kind of rare in Egyptian art. Even later on, um, uh, they show the enemy being slain in battle, things of this kind. But mutilating the enemy dead to this extent is not something that you see very often later. With some important uh, exceptions that I will show you in a little while. So, this is the mysterious Nama Khaled. This is a, uh, maybe a, a, little bit, a little better photographic gives you an idea of the high quality uh, of the palette. Um, again, it's the smiling scene here, and um, here you can notice this emblematic group which shows uh, the Falcon God Horus, and this uh, uh, this object was dedicated at a temple that was probably uh, 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 for Horus. Um, and he is uh, kind of dominating uh, an embodied piece of land with papyrus growing out of it, so it's like marshland of some kind. Uh, and uh, he is holding the nose ring of the um, unfortunate embodiment humanization uh, of this region. Um, uh, uh, and then we have this fully human of Norman down below. Oh, the other thing to mention about it, of course, which is terribly important, so I forgot it, um, is that on uh, this side of the palette, Nama is wearing a tall white crown that will forever after signify southern Egypt. And on this side, he is wearing the kind of flattish or reddish crown, uh, which is emblematic of northern Egypt. Um, and so here we have a kind of very definitive status that under Nama, at least, the country was united together. Some Egyptologists believe that happened earlier. The evidence is a little less clear. Now, um, Nama's palette is something we wouldn't want to use. Two feet, three feet, I don't care. It's a big, heavy piece of stone. And I've described it as something that you could use to do prepare the cosmetic and put it on the image. But in fact, it would be very big and awkward. Now, maybe two people could do it. One person now holding it, the other person mixing it all up, uh, but it's quite possible that the Nama Pellet, like some other related objects at the same time, uh, was purely ceremonial. It wasn't meant to be used. It was presented to the god of the temple and no doubt kept in the shrine or the sanctuary or some inner part of the temple. Uh, um, and it uh, signified a lot to the god and to the king who had commissioned the making of this object, uh, but it was not necessarily something that would actually have been used. If they um, anointed and um, uh, made up the god's image and so forth. They may have had small, perfectly functional uh, palettes that they used um, for the ritual that were also uh, handleable. Uh, you get a better idea of the, 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 the ceremonial nature of these palettes from this object, uh, 
uh, which was actually found at the same site, it's a pear-shaped mesa, like the one that um, Nama is, is seeing. See the little round pear-shaped mesa he's got where he's striking? Uh, this is a, a, a representation in stone of such a mesa. But it's about this big and about this wide. It's hugely heavy, so you would never use it. It's being presented to the god again as a ceremonial object uh, that nobody would be using. Uh, you couldn't pick it up, really, and even if you managed to get a piece of wood in it to hold it together, it would break off as soon as you did it because of the weight of the wood. Um, again, important representations on it, but um, I don't want to get mixed up with those, so we won't. Just a little bit about where the Nama palette came from. Um, this is a, a, a schematic map of the important uh, temple, an important temple site at the uh, place today called Hierapolis in southern Egypt, uh, excavated many years ago and then subsequently re-explored by uh, later projects. Um, but already in the early excavations, uh, they discovered a very, oh, well, I might say enigmatic uh, uh, situation um, where uh, they discovered that there was a large, very large, high, sandy mound with stone walling around it to maintain it in place, uh, uh, which had been a, a principal feature of this early cult area. Um, that was taken to mean, as well as a lot of other data, to mean that there had been a temple, an early temple in this vicinity, although it was very hard for the excavators because of a lot of later activity to find traces of that temple. And most Egyptologists think that the early temple had stood on the top of this mound. Um, the building you see there now is a later building. But the idea is originally there was an early temple on it, and it was um, removed at some point and replaced by um, a later cult building. Um, of course, there could have been a building up there, but there is no direct proof of it. And what has always struck me is that down here, this general area, are uh, in situ architectural elements that certainly date to Dynasty Zero, Dynasty One, but they're very, very early, and they're in situ. And they are a, a part of a gateway, a part of a doorway or a gateway arrangement. Um, I should say, by the way, that the Nama palette, like a lot of these other early objects, came from this general area. And it's generally thought they had once been in the temple, but they were taken out and ceremonially disposed of at a, um, as one of the spring cleaning of temples that the Egyptians apparently periodically undertook every hundred odd years or so. Um, so that's where the palette came from, not in some context. But in this area, you actually have a part of an early structure in place, and, and very impressively in place. Um, it was a threshold, big slab of stone for the entryway, the doorway, or the uh, gateway. Um, and then it, next to it, in place, was this massive uh, representation of a bound prisoner. Again, the theme of hostility, his arms tied together at the elbows. And then his head projecting out past the threshold, out into the courtyard or whatever it was of the temple that stood um, in, in, in front. Uh, so, again, this picks up the theme of the alien force that the god subordinates with the, in association with the king, uh, but it's also an indication, I think, that the original temple was not on the mound, but was laid was down where uh, later temples actually were also found, built on the same spot. Uh, what I do want to do is now pick out a few iconographic items and, and talk about how they help us to understand the palette. Uh, first of all, the palette and the Nama Palette, interesting in itself, had a prehistory, had a history behind it. It, it, it is related to uh, palettes of late prehistoric and even early historic times. So uh, it's got a, a, a long set of antecedents that should be taken in, in consideration when uh, trying to understand this meaning. Uh, there is also some imagery which is found very dramatically later on, and the smiting pharaoh is a very good example of that. So to that extent, the Nama Pellet has got a future where it's made in the uh, 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 transition between Dynasty Zero and Dynasty One. Um, that early time, um, this motif at least is something that's going to be continually replicated um, for long, long periods of time. And which I should say, 
It's also anticipated earlier in much less iconographically impressive uh, renderings um, in earlier periods of prehistoric times and well, late prehistoric times. Uh, here is a very well-known relief from the Temple of Karnak. It uh, uh, is dated to Tutmosis III, so it's about 1,500 years after the Nama of Ballet. And on it is this dramatic image of the king grasping not just one enemy foe, but a whole group of them, by the hand, just like Nama did, um, and lifting his mace. You can just see the remaining head of the mace up there, uh, ready to smite these terrorized and um, helpless enemies. Um, and you find these images going all the way back into the old kingdom, and they're going to continue on really for virtually all of Egyptian history. Uh, so here we have Ptolemy the, the second, much later, uh, um, in one of the temples that were built under uh, Ptolemaic patronage, uh, and there he is, very like uh, Nama, and even more like Tutmosis III. His hand reached up, but controlling a huge group of terrified uh, foreign foes enemy foes, and raising his mace uh, uh, in order to, um, well, in order to do what? I'm not quite sure whether he actually ever used the mace or whether it were to understand it's an emblematic representation of dominion and power, uh, other power and other terror on the part of the foe. Uh, so this is a nice example of the history that the iconography of the Nama this is, uh, takes us back into the um, earlier history of the palette. It's prehistory, if you like. Cosmetic palettes of the same kind of material that we used in the Nama palette uh, are appearing quite early on in the prehistoric period. Uh, it, they sometimes have rather abstract forms. You can also see they really have been used. Uh, there are there's areas where you can see things have been browned and sometimes part of the color had survived. So these were already cosmetic palettes, but in this case, dedicated to uh, people, not deities, and found placed in their graves when they used in the afterlife. Um, these also, those of you who saw Diana Patrick's great exhibit, if you remember this, uh, uh, they also start to transform the palette. It still maintains its function, it still maintains its basic material, but they start to give it the form of various creatures, like fish, two birds somehow joined together, um, and uh, there are all there are a number of important implications, symbolic implications um, about these palettes already uh, that um, Diana explored in, in the book about um, the early art that she she published. Uh, issues having to do with fertility and production, and references to different categories of animals and birds, and different features of the Egyptian landscape. So there's a lot of meaning already in these relatively simple earlier palettes. By the way, you can see the, sh the form is going to be typical of the Nama palette beginning to appear much, much earlier than its time. <coughs> then you also get um, uh, palettes which are much closer in time and much closer in form and decoration to the Nama palette. Uh, I guess most of them would be probably dated to the Disney Zero period. I don't quite know how far back one would want to take it. But these are characterized by relatively large size, though they're sometimes, you know, quite handleable, um, relatively small, not as large as the Nama Palat or a few others. Um, and they show, some of them, uh, uh, they emphasize, like some of the prehistoric art before them, the kind of animal world. Uh, and so here you see animals, which are mostly desert animals, antelopes, gazelle, things of this kind, being attacked by other animals who are felines, very fierce, very predatory. Uh, in some cases, they're actually also hunting dogs, so there's a little um, human element indirectly led into it. There are also mythical creatures, like this um, winged uh, feline that you have here. The famous serpent parts turn up again, going around the circular area used for cosmetics. And uh, here, here you can see some of the hunting dogs, which I think uh, they were in colors, so they actually represent a kind of um, subtle entry of the human into this imagery. Uh, but looking at it, um, it's hard to imagine that this represents an actual event. Uh, and that's an important point, because one part of the debate about the Nama Palette is, does it represent events, or at least historic events, 
for other kinds of events which are more ceremonial in nature. And so two dogs is important right, palette because it shows that the subject matter of these ceremonial palettes can be very broad and generalized and symbolically charged rather than meaningful. Now, you get larger palettes, like the Hindus palette, which is roughly the size of the Nama palette, um, decorated on one face, here's the big circular area, and it's full of humans, lots of animals, but also humans, who are hunters, but doing really quite inexplicable things. People have tried to explain what's going on, but really, I think, um, it's, there's almost no hope of an intelligible explanation. Uh, but the focus is now on a feline which is no longer powerful and dominant, but is in fact being dominated by these hunters. Here it is full of arrows that hunters have shot at it. There it is up there, uh, uh, apparently overcoming one hunter, but already uh, wounded um, and experiencing um, a negative uh, impact of interaction with humans. Now some uh, scholars would argue that this is a specific event and that, uh, that uh, it's to celebrate uh, some specific hunt, and it's great, uh, apparently, a uh, great uh, success, even though we don't know what it is. Um, others would say, uh, no, it's almost uh, something in the way of a uh, charm to, to ensure that hunting is always good for humanity. So it's more generalized, but it still has that specific kind of function. Um, and then there is part of yet another large pellet, uh, which is uh, back then about the size, would have been the size of the Nama palette. Um, and in this case, uh, there's a very complex set of scenes, not all surviving. It's again, it's the side of the, on which the cosmetic was prepared. Um, and in this case, you have uh, uh, someone being attacked and, and slain by a lion. And we would always say, oh, it probably represents the king of the period because we're so used to kings being called lions later on, but that may not be the case. And you also have dead people with vultures attacking them on the field of battle, presumably, including a prisoner who, uh, somewhat like the prisoners on the Nama Palette, is dead and a bird pecking at his eyes. And it's kind of hostile uh, disfigurement maiming going on here. And then up here, you have two prisoners being ushered in by uh, standards and activated uh, standards. And then over here you have the lower part of another prisoner with his hands bound behind his back, and then an enigmatic person behind him uh, who doesn't look like a bound prisoner is wearing a long uh, robe. Uh, what's interesting is that so it looks like a presentation of prisoners after a great victory which involved killing all these enemies. What's interesting though is um, the prisoners are being presented as far as one can see to the empty circular cosmetic part. They're not being presented to some divine image. Uh, um, uh, you know, we don't really know what went on, what went on, what, but there are yet further examples of damaged prisoners up there, so, or enemy up there. So this whole motif may have simply spread over the whole thing. Uh, but it's very striking that uh, the presentation is being made, seems to be made, to the, to the circular motif itself. So, that's the political map of early Egypt. So let's talk about the, quote, unification of Egypt. The, Egypt in historic times uh, always emphasized the fact that it represented the union of two regions, southern Egypt and northern Egypt. And historically, when there was internal trouble, Egypt did tend to fall into two regions that might become competitive with each other, both in the south and the north. But the idea is that at some point in, in the prehistoric or early historic times in Tennessee Zero, uh, there must have been the first time union. There must have been a time when somehow rule, a ruler brought unity to Egypt and this, uh, uh, this uh, union of the two lands was set up. Um, so this is why it's so significant that the Nabo is the white crown of Upper Egypt and the red crown of Northern Egypt. So it makes this statement that he's the king of both lands. It doesn't necessarily say he's the first king of United Egypt. Um, some scholars would argue that this is such an elaborate uh, item as this ceremonial palette ought to refer to some specific uh, historic action. Um, and so uh, they prefer to think that this actually really is a celebration of Nama's victory as the southern king over the northern part of Egypt and the creation of the unified monarchy and the uh, uh, 
adoption by Pharaoh of the brigade there in crowns and so forth, which represent uh, the two halves of the country. Um, and so this would be some typical, actual, specific uh, enemy of the period. Uh, there's a little two hieroglyphs next to him, which can be read phonetically. Uh, you know, so, so some people call him, identify him as a particular individual called Wash. Uh, associated with papyri. So that would make him a northerner, right? Because uh, the, the delta is full of papyrus marshes. There is a lot of papyrus marshes in the delta, but there are papyrus marshes around Egypt. So um, it's not such a certain way of, of reaching that name. At the other extreme, there are other scholars who suggest that really none of these palettes, including the Nile palette, uh, uh, are trying to tell, uh, trying to describe or depict specific historic events. Like, a specific uh, a union of the two land achieved by a specific victory, by a specific king, at a specific time. And their suggestion is that most of what you see going on, despite its sort of warlike uh, characteristics, are really the performances of ceremonies by the king. Ceremonies that were embedded into kingship already and would be uh, repeated by the king at regular intervals, maybe every year, maybe over specific span of time, uh, but that, it, it, that we shouldn't read these as um, um, kind of historically uh, specific. Again, it's an open question. Uh, people can uh, uh, disagree about it. Um, and uh, there are early examples of the smiting scenes. This is, goes all the way back to, I think, the God of One. Uh, this is in the God of Two. Well, in the prehistoric times, and this is the more iconographically um, recognizable version of the Nile Palette. But here again, it looks like an image that's being drawn upon from prehistoric times and uh, put into this new style. Um, I'd like to finish up uh, over the next few minutes and then by talking about things that changed my mind about the Nile Palette. I said, I didn't feel you should uh, uh, call upon later materials to try to understand such an early object. It was okay to look back at the earlier palettes. Uh, that made sense because Nama's palette is part of that whole sequence of development, but, but it's such a unique object. And that's what we found later. Uh, there is anticipations of later uh, um, uh, iconography, but also other things which seem rather unique uh, to this period. You don't have a history later on. Well, as I said, I changed uh, all my ideas about that. Um, and it's all Diana Patch's fault. She's a good one, so I'm happy to say that. Um, Diana Patch wrote a very fascinating article and published it some years ago um, about uh, an unusual costume that, could, that was depicted being worn by a whole variety of kings. Not very often, but stretching over a very long period. I think Nama was maybe the earliest example, and then you can track it down from various related to various kings, uh, down to, uh, I think it was Seti the first, and then maybe after that, uh, examples that would survive. So it's rare, but it's a very distinctive costume, and Diana pointed out, Nama is wearing it. He's not wearing just some regular old royal costume. He's wearing something very specific. Uh, it has distinctive features, and if I get some of them wrong, Diana will tell you later, uh, uh, like this um, uh, uh, apron-like object here, uh, this net-like object here, uh, uh, the emphasis on the red crown is important here, and then there is something that looks quite minute, and why would that be meaningful? It's a little bird amulet attached to uh, part, of the, uh, part of the costume. Um, and um, Diane was able to show that this is worn not only by Nama, but variously by other kings over time, and that it was a ritual that was associated with the rising of the sun god. So it had a very specific set of meanings. This costume that kings wore when they were performing a ritual that was presumably pretty rare, that, that celebrated or was involved in the rising of the sun god. And not just the rising of the sun god, uh, but in uh, aspects of the sun god that you have to go down several centuries away from the Nama period to uh, the appearance of the pyramid text at the end of the Fifth Dynasty, uh, which talk about the, the, the adventures of the sun god um, uh, in terms of 
his annual, uh, his daily uh, experience of seeming to die and then be revived and return and rise again in the sky and then illuminate the world and be sure that the cosmos continues. Uh, one of the themes, though, is that the return of the sun god to full vitality and power and the survival of the cosmos was opposed by negative forces uh, who wanted to end that. Um, and that also there were entities, sometimes represented by stars, who preceded the sun god. Um, you know, in the sky, the Egyptians could see there are stars up there, they maybe imagined other creatures. Uh, before the sun god returned, before dawn took place, uh, there are all these uh, other entities that are in front of the sun god. And the pyramid texts seem to make it pretty clear that uh, these are entities which are dangerous to the sun god, uh, that are potentially harmful, potentially blocking his cycle, um, and so they have to be killed. And that's why the sky is red at dawn. That's the blood of the sun god's enemies filling the sky. Um, not only are they killed, they are then prepared to be food for the sun god. The sun god will eat them. That's a famous part of the, part of the uh, uh, pyramid text, which is called the Cannibal Hymn. But there are many, lots of other references. Uh, this is all being explored by, uh, by many people, but I was following Kachagov's wonderful book about Egyptian crowns. There's a lot of information about this kind of thing. Um, uh, and and uh, so you get all this stuff in the, the pyramid text. So you have material from the pyramid text several hundred years after Nama. Uh, you have Nama uh, wearing a costume which turns up over the next thousand, fifteen hundred years or so. Uh, more occasionally by kings, but apparently um, quite um, significant. So that made the bringing in the pyramid text uh, made me think about, well, maybe we can use these later materials a bit more. Uh, Kathy Wells' books about crowns was also very important in pointing out that things like the red crown, yes, they're emblematic of um, northern Egypt, uh, but they also represent many other things. And she said, you know, really, the way the crown is described in the pyramid text, it is a kind of glistening red color. Well, she said, it is the color of freshly spilled blood. Uh, and so she sees the red crown as part of this whole issue of um, the king somehow assisting or celebrating the victory of the sun god over his potential enemies. All right, so the enemies, okay, prepared as food. You would think pretty unusual, uh, surviving in written versions of the sun god's adventures, but um, not really appearing again. But of course they do. Look at these decapitated um, individuals uh, on the Nama Pella, and look at these decapitated human figures who represent demonic or sinful entities in the netherworld of the New Kingdom. These are images you see in the royal tombs of the New Kingdom, very rich iconographic uh, elements, uh, but um, it includes representations of uh, enemies of Osiris, enemies of the sun god, enemies of the dead king. Uh, uh, which have been subdued and, and subject to mutilation uh, uh, very similar to uh, what was seen on the uh, thousands of years later. Um, and um, we actually see uh, parts of these demonic forces being cooked, put in, uh, put in ovens, uh, so that there's that same overturn of, of the sun god consuming his enemies who are uh, decapitated so they can be hung upside down and they'll be bled dry, they'll be more palatable as meat, um, and various other things at times to make them um, attractive foodstuffs. Uh, that kind of thing, and apparently the sun god really did. And, uh, why, he, why he liked them is noted in the pyramid text that the sun god has to eat all these enemies so that the many can become the one. So the sun god becomes incredibly powerful by eating and absorbing of all these. But I find it, you know, really quite uh, amazing to, to look at this material from New Kingdom tombs uh, in, uh, uh, and then go back to imagery. I'm not suggesting that New Kingdom uh, um, painters, designers, are aware of this kind of representation at all, whether on Nam or anything else. 
Uh, but what I'm saying is that the themes that are explored here are the same kind of themes that are explored here. And then the conventions of Egyptian art, you know, uh, kind of uh, bring them to create some very similar images about it. One of the interesting representations of these slaughtered enemies uh, is this boat. Um, it's a boat with a high, to a high prow, a high stern, uh, some kind of structure on it, not very clearly defined. Um, a god, uh, a falcon with a harpoon, a floating bubble that may represent the god Horus, a bird uh, inserted in front of it, and then this uh, strange looking thing which looks like the leaf of a door or a gate swinging on a pivot. Kind of pivoted door, actually, that would grind into that bound prisoner that uh, I showed you from the early temple of Hyperopolis. So, what is this all about? Um, again, many, many interpretations, uh, but um, uh, I think given the emphasis now on assisting the sun god, destroying the sun god's enemies, the king assuming special costumes, which are ceremonially relevant to the sun god, uh, I think it's legitimate to look at things like this. This is a, a representation from, uh, I think it's a third intermediate period, uh, uh, Book of the Dead, you know, all these things are being made. And these depict, you know, gods, and especially in the netherworld, uh, processing and uh, the dead being involved and gaining immortality in this way. Uh, and so this is just one of many such representations. This shows the sun god uh, seated in um, uh, the, the solar bark, the boat shaped vehicle that carries him through the netherworld, and then there's another one that he enters where he finally rises up in the sky, and that's the other solar boat that he, that he sails through the sky. It's got a high prow, it's got a high stern. Um, it's uh, got a strange rectangular feature in front of it that does not look like the door, whatever it is, the door element, um, but, but, but there's a certain visual similarity between the two, and it's got a bird. It's got a bird, just like that's got a bird. Um, and Diana points out in her article that the, that bird and the bird that is uh, the amulet on the costume is a swallow. It's a very specific kind of bird, and apparently swallows behave at, at dawn in a way that indicates they have a special relationship to the rising sun. That's why they're there on the costume. They, they have a special relationship to the rising sun. Um, and so here you have the swallow here, and here you have what I've suggested is the swallow on the Nile of Hallet. So here I am delving now into post-1000 BC material, um, uh, recklessly pulling in at everything that I think has got some relevance to this. Um, um, well, this that's another representation maybe of a silver bar that um, appears on an object, early object. Um, I should say that the name of Ra, the sun god, has not survived from this period. Uh, so those of you who are purists can say, oh, Maybe there is no sun god. Well, that's okay. That's up to you. Um, he, surely the sun god had very deep roots in Egyptian thinking and religion, so I think he was there uh, well before the dynasty zero and, and beyond. I, I think the earliest example is of the second dynasty royal stealer that is now in the Metropolitan Museum. So, um, I don't think this is the end of trying to reinterpret the uh, Nama palette. It, it's speculative, but I, I, I don't care about that because most everything you say about Egypt, whoever you are, is speculative. The data are either ambiguous and open to different interpretations, or they're not fully preserved, so the key I am or the key that I am isn't there, actually, uh, decisive. Uh, but I think if you allow for this highly ceremonial aspect with this, uh, this is not a ceremonial character because at least it's continued on and on. Uh, it doesn't have to refer to some specific historical event. Um, it also makes you kind of look at other parts of the whole thing. Um, and just to finish up, I would point out that the top of the Nama palette has, is, is depressed in the middle. It goes out and then down. And depicted on both faces are this uh, cow uh, horned uh, human faced goddess uh, who is a goddess called Bart who uh, represents heaven. 
So there's a kind of cosmological dimension to the Naam palette. You have uh, these pictures representing them. The indentation, which clearly goes back to the use of this kind of indentation uh, on earlier palettes, um, is also rather distinctive because anything that's really distinctive about it has been ironed out, and you just get these two uh, high features above a shallow feature in which is sitting the name of the king, King Kama. Um, and, and so um, that reminds one of the later, of course, Egyptian representation uh, for the Akhet, for the horizon with its two mountains over which the sun rises every day and signals the renewal of the cosmos. Uh, but of course, here, um, we don't have the sun. We have the king, maybe the king's name is being thought of as the descendant um, uh, uh, thing. Uh, but all of this is connected with looking after an image of the deity, doing cosmetics, and so forth. Um, but um, to, to be complete, the, the uh, image of the archive, if that's what it is, um, uh, needs to have the sun disk floating above it. It doesn't have the sun disk floating above it, but it raises the possibility that this is the sun disk. And that is the circular feature which is making its way up through the ceremonies that signal the, the, the destruction of uh, enemies who would oppose uh, that uh, ascension. Um, I don't know how good that last point is, but as I said, I'm amongst friends. Who can stand up and cast the first stone? Thank you. <laughs>
Pharaoh. And then one day in a lecture, uh, I saw somebody um, exhibiting a Nile catfish. And it was as big as the guy. <laughs> Apparently there are these giant catfish which are predators and eat other fish, live on other fish. So it isn't such a strange name for a king who wants to manifest uh, power. Predators. Do you think hieroglyphics were fully developed by, by that time? Oh, that's a very good question. I want someone else to answer. Yeah. Um, I would say, why would I? What, what do you guys think? Give me it's a still point. experimental. <laughs> still experimental. Yeah, I, uh, I actually uh, had uh, Ogden Gallet, who's my colleague here, <coughs> here tonight, um, uh, talk about early writing to my seminar on early Egypt. And uh, it's exactly what he said. He, he doesn't feel the writing system is, is fixed enough to really talk about it. And he says, um, not fair to quote him, but he says most of the interpretation of the made are to him quite implausible. From the tomb of Scorpio, the Scorpion King, prior that they found those little palaces, yeah. supposedly could be translated as hieroglyphs, and taxes were collected or something in certain areas. Oh, oh, oh! So, you mean from Tomb UJ? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, no, UJ. absolutely. But again, but there is debate about those little letters. Not everyone accepts that you can read them phonetically. Uh -huh. uh, in other words, that it's emblematic. It communicates meanings that were obvious to the people doing it. But to actually sit down and say, well, historically this was Ab, and so I'm going to read it as Ab, I think there there's a, an area for disagreement. I actually think that there could be some sort of association of forms between the catfish and the chisel and the palette itself, because they all share a very, very similar form. And I'm wondering whether there is some sort of relationship um, between if you flip it 90 degrees, and then if you zoom in into the chisel, it seems to share a similar form. So maybe the form can have some sort of association. Then you mean the outline of the palette recalls the outline of the catfish, and, the and then the chisel is somewhat similar if you line it up? Well, I've never thought of that, um, <laughs> which doesn't mean um, that's it's not a good idea. Um, um, it's an interesting thing to bring up. This is what amazes me about the Nama Pele. <coughs> Two years ago, I wouldn't be expecting I'd be studying all this kind of stuff, <laughs> reaching into books of the dead and the pyramid, oh, scattering it all over the Nama Pele and saying this is what it's all about. Um, so um, it's, to me, the amazing thing about the Nama Pele is you'd think it's hard and fast now. We understand what it is. But it seems to me we still have very limited understanding of what it is and what they were trying to represent with it, and so there may be something like that. And if you think back, of course, there are examples of earlier pellets, much simpler, which are in the shape of fish, actually. So there's a whole issue of what animals and creatures are represented. Okay, the bottom part on the left side, I think, is supposed to, or is interpreted as representing and breaking down the city wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would that fit into your cosmological analysis of the rising sun? Well, it wouldn't really. Having uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, said that, I actually do have a thought about it. Um, yeah. You know, we know the Egyptians, to the Egyptian cosmos, that was heaven, the earth, and the netherworld. Um, and the netherworld was a dangerous place where there were creatures you saw had that have to be overcome killed and maimed and so on and so on. Um, these, this presumably represents the king, you know, this great creature. But this is an alien looking person, so outside of Egypt person. And, and this looks like, as you said, a, a wall that's being broken down. So it, it's, a, it's a, like a representation of royal power capturing and destroying a defended alien town and trampling down someone who represents the aliens. Um, so you could think of it in historic terms, but in later Egyptian thinking, which I'm not so fond of, in later Egyptian thinking, uh, foreign aliens are equivalent to the demons of the netherworld when they oppose the king. And this is obviously someone who's opposing the king. And so this may actually kind of have a, a subtle or a hidden overtone referring to the netherworld. And you can also think about that um, over here with more slavery. Thinking about the other part of the bottom, 
Right. Could it possibly be a continuation of the scene? Oh. Both sides. Okay. To continue running from the king. Of the a very king. able scholar called Whitney Davis wrote many years ago a whole oh, big book. I don't know that I'll serve one of the comments. And one of the things he tried to show is that the Nama Palette and some other palettes had a kind of narrative element, but they actually told a sequential story. Um, and this is part of his theory where he says, you know, you go from this image and then you have to read that image and then you go over here and you read that image and then you go back to the other place. So, it, and, and he actually discussed how would people, why would people spread the narrative in this fashion over the two faces. Um, uh, but his notion was that um, you could do it if you wanted to read it, um, and so you could have it mounted vertically, and whoever wanted to read it could walk around it and have a look at it. Generally, the idea didn't get a lot of acceptance because, well, it's partly the issue of interpreting the scenes and do they form a sequence, but it was partly the kind of awkwardness of the whole thing. But it, 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 it was addressing this very issue that you raised is there some kind of sequence of events here. And other people have tried to read the sequence more simply in terms of what's uh, represented on it. Uh, my feeling about the narrative is whatever was intended, if this was intended for a god, the god didn't care. The god didn't care if you had to look at the other side because gods could do everything. I, I don't think this idea works, but if it did work, I don't think it would be a problem to the recipient of the object. I had a different thought about the um, the, um, the chisel. Um, that's usually translated as mirror. I used to be an Egyptology student at the Oriental Institute. And the meaning of mare usually is, from everything I can tell, it means illness, sickness, pain. But there's a second <coughs> way that you can transliterate um, the chisel, and that's called ab. And that's, if you notice, if you remember the um, uh, the hieroglyphic form of the um, uh, elephantine, it uses the oh, chisel, yes, yes, and it's, yes, it's yes, called okay. ab. And in, in the Egyptian language, there's a word called abeh, which starts out with the chisel, and the, mean, the word means to unite. And so I'm wondering if the chisel really is not mer, but ab, meaning to unite. <laughs> Okay, I am totally unqualified to deal meaningfully with that. Laddie, I don't know whether you want to take a little stab at the interesting proposition. I'd be, I would be very surprised if, if the word Abek were written without the heel. Yeah. Yeah, take a look at Faulkner's. But, but Mayor, but I mean, this is written, there's no MR. I mean, there's no MR like in the way it's usually written. But the there is a word for, for, for Mayor, which is just, isn't there? I mean, I looked, I looked, I looked, I'll double check, but okay. I'll there, check is, there is a chisel, there is a chisel that's used in the word to unite. All right, so here we have a typical situation about the Nama Palette. Great minds cannot agree. <laughs> <laughs> My great mind is telling me, get the hell out of here. <laughs>